8, 20th of June 2000, the Ulster Freedom Fighters reserves the right to shoot any person Tonight, Spotlight can reveal that this masked UFF terrorist is one of those at the centre of the Shankill feud. Loyalist paramilitary leaders are engaged in crisis talks to end the vicious war raging on the Shankill between the UVF and the UFFC company. But the voices of peace are having to struggle to be heard above the cries of fear and loathing spawned by seven weeks of violence. I hate them. I wish them all dead. Every last one. And I know every one of them, and I'll never shut my mouth because they murdered my father. I feel that I'm a refugee from the Moorish Africa. I was put out of my home with nowhere to go, carrying plastic bags full of mementos. There's no way that C Company will be ostracised from the rest of the organisation. I will not rest until I see C Company finished. As far as I'm concerned, these people are scum. A bitter internecine feud has ripped the heart out of the shankle. The Ulster Volunteer Force and the Ulster Freedom Fighters are locked in a bloody conflict which has set families and neighbours at each other's throats. But what is the feud about? Is it, as the Secretary of State has suggested, pure gangsterism, a battle for control of the drugs trade? Or is there a political dimension to the front line on the Shankill? It was a parade by the Ulster Defence Association, the UFF's parent organisation, which brought gun law to the Shankill. The marchers carried a flag from the Loyalist Volunteer Force, a group hated by the UVF who denounced the LVF as drug dealers. When UVF supporters attacked the flag, the Shankill feud ignited. You don't attack parades. It's not a done thing. There was 5,000 UDA men on the Shankill Road on that Saturday of that parade, and they attacked. What did you expect? A UDA parade was attacked. UVF brought that on themselves. Within hours, the UFF hit back with two gun attacks on the bar from which the UVF had attacked the parade. Six people were wounded. If the UFF had not have attacked their axe bar and not done all the things that they'd done, nobody would have been dead. The UVF wouldn't have needed to go out and do anything. Gunmen were back on the shankle with loyalists in their sights. The first deaths were Bobby Mahood and UDA man Jackie Coulter, gunned down by the UVF as they sat in a car on the Crumlin Road. I feel it's just like a dream that's going to end. But it'll never end. They won't even let me grieve my husband. They went up to his grave. They lifted the flowers and I threw them in a skip. They just constantly torture me because I won't keep my mouth shut. And I don't intend to keep my mouth shut because I'm not afraid of the UVF. And I got my photo engraved. And you see that there, that's written on it? That's, that's what they are. The word is scum. Hatred of the UVF has been made worse by the refusal of the PUP's representative on the Shankill to condemn the double murder. I think it's a tragedy. And what I'm saying is that the blame should lie fairly and squarely where it belongs, and that's the UFF and the Lord Shankill. They were the people who created those deaths. Nobody else, them. The UFF's retaliation was equally brutal. Sam Rocket, a 22-year-old UVF man, was shot seven times in front of his partner and baby daughter. My child's never, ever, ever going to remember Daddy, all because of him. Again, the political spokesman for the killers, John White of the Ulster Democratic Party, refused to condemn the UFF murder. The difficulty that, that I have in, in representing um, a power of the organisation is that you have to maintain their confidence. And when you go down that road of, of condemning, uh, it, it doesn't help. The commander of the UFFC company is Johnny Adair. Convicted of directing terrorism, he was released under the Good Friday Agreement but re-arrested within days of the outbreak of the feud. In Adair's absence, John White is the UVF's number one target. Wherever he goes, he's surrounded by minders. We're taking a short walk to the Pony Club. You, you've got some associates with you. Is it like this all the time? Well, it has been like this for a, a number of weeks. Um, there are uh, car loads of UVF men driving about, trying to abduct people and to assault people. Uh, and you only have to come from this area in order, order for them to do that. 
Less than a mile up the road is one of Billy Hutchinson's minders, complete with flak jacket. We arranged to meet Billy Hutchinson on the Shankill, hoping we could film him walking about talking to some of his constituents. But he said that would be far too dangerous. He said he would only speak to us from inside the Rex bar. A PUP assembly member, Billy Hutchinson's the political representative most closely associated with the other side of this feud, the UVF. It's obvious that uh, you can't walk about freely uh, and you can't stand about street corners, otherwise you will be attacked. So I don't think that you can walk about freely, but I try to do as much as I can. I'm not going to let these people stop me from walking up and down the Shangle Road, uh, but you don't make yourself a target either. While the two figureheads are holed up at either end of the Shankill, both sides have unleashed a wave of terrifying intimidation on those they see as their enemy supporters. The Shankill has been virtually cut in two. The UVF holds sway in the upper Shankill, its numbers swollen by hundreds of supporters driven out of the lower Shankill. There, the UFF's power base has been strengthened by supporters fleeing the other way. Some of those forced to move support neither side. We've had members of the Ulster Unionist Party put out, we've had supporters of the Ulster Unionist Party put out, and of course we've had people um, who would be neither members nor supporters, but yet we may have helped and would have would, would vote for Ulster Unionist candidates have been put out. It's, it's, uh, there's no hermetically sealed boxes of UDA, UVF and, and, and community. It's just one box here, it's the community. I'm an innocent man here, plowed in my home, for no wrong, and there's many people in this area, I'll tell you. There's even ones that put me out of my home, I'll tell you, that I'm not a UDA man, or any organisation, and I just can't understand it. It's car uh, scandalous, it's scandalous, I'm innocent. That man says he was the victim of the UVF. The anger and misery is the same on both sides. Many of these families are the victims of the UFF. First of all, they sisters. Their mother was buried on the Monday, and they all Five families put out madness. Like, how are we meant to say, Sarah's mother? Yeah. That's man like on the Kermoney graveyard, but like saying scumbags. It's very difficult to prove we did what, unless you were there actually to see it happening. Then people just walked in and took my home over, so they did. I have a son serving in the forces, and my son's being threatened. He's not even here. He's in Sierra Leone. And my son phoned from Sierra Leone last night. They told my son to get off and off the phone, as if and heard of him out and lived there. John White's on after the TV and radio day in and day out, giving his say. But there's nobody coming forward to give our say. Nobody. It's all what the UVS doing on the poor innocent UVA. There's nothing being said about our ones. We just can't put a foot to doors and tell people you've half the morning tonight and walk into their homes. I got nothing out of my home. Absolutely nothing. I had to leave my night clothes. I'm heartbroken. I love my house. I love the area. I love my neighbours. I, I never in my wildest dreams thought they would ever, ever, ever had to leave it. I'm not the only pensioner that put it. They put a 94-year-old woman out yesterday, I just heard. There was four of them actually, but there was about 30 or 40 at the diamond, at the corner. And the minute I left, the minute I left that house, they were in and wrecked and smashed all around them. I felt terrible. I really did feel terrible. I cried, I broke my heart. There are claims and counter claims, but the housing executive says more than 100 families have left the lower shankle. Johnny Adair's wife disagrees. It's the UVF that is intimidating their own people. Their own people's running to the housing executive, the PUP, using names or excuse, and saying that the, the lower shankle people is intimidating them out. Nobody's intimidated anybody out. You bring any one of the UVF, the, the people that has been intimidated, you bring them to us, us people in the lower shankle. And we'll ask them, who was it came to you to intimidate you out of your houses? Because it's a load of lies, a whole lot of it. It's the PUP has drummed us into these people's heads. I got that phone call to my house. And I, and I got a brief, because they're in the shankle in my car. They left them staying above Ang Street again, and getting, the car's getting rippled. And I'm getting shot dead. These are supposed to be hard men, um, what you would class as um, true loyalists. And the true loyalists are intimidating the women and the children and the lower shankle estate. I'll, I'll These are supposed to be men, but they're wee boys. Like their supporters, the political leaders of the two sides are engaged in an orgy of mutual recriminations. John White admits the UFF have put some people out of their homes, but claims most of those leaving the lower shankle did so of their own free will.
the vast majority of other people who left, left of their own volition. Now, that's not to say that they did feel under threat, but, you know, if you look at what happened this last two or three weeks, the UVF are putting Protest uh, Protestants out of their homes. Billy Hutchinson, addressing a rally in Ballymena, is equally certain that all of the ills of the feud can be led at the door of the UFF. In fact, for quite some time, because of a stand for democracy, it's Billy Hutchinson. Thank you, Billy. People will expect me to, uh, probably to make a speech about what has happened in the last five weeks. But tonight, what we are doing is we're celebrating the Covenant. I will not rest until ICC Company finished. As far as I'm concerned, these people are scum, drug dealers, and don't deserve. They even live in the shackle, because what they have done to our people is unbelievable. The Provost couldn't do it in 30 years, but these people did in a matter of hours. While both sides blame each other for the evictions, there is evidence to suggest that there have been more victims on one side than the other. Well, let's say of the 205 or whatever families put out, I would say probably about 75% have been intimidated by one of the paramilitary groups and maybe 25% by the other. There are now almost 240 families who have had to move. Spotlight understands there are independent figures to show that the majority of them blame the UFF. But all have suffered, including the bereaved on both sides. The house where UFF murder victim Sam Rocket lived was burnt out. At the peak of the intimidation, there weren't enough removal vans to keep pace with the evictions. Almost a thousand people have been directly affected, among them the Coulters, victims of the UVF. It's been hell. They've ruined my whole life, my whole family, so they took away the most precious thing in our lives. They took away my daddy, and I'll never, ever, ever get over it. They've ruined our lives, they've destroyed it, along with a whole lot of other people's, but they still don't want to give up because they're still intending to ruin our lives now. They, they, they want to carry it on. My father is a uh, mother of the month, and we haven't got one, a chance to greet him that month to the UVF. They've given us three death threats. We've no, we've no more choice. We have to go. Either go or be carried out. That's our, that's our warning. So, what do you call this house? Jokingly, it's referred to as a big brother's house. And how many people are living here? Well, at any one time, you could have roughly between 11 and 13 people here. One of those who said he was a victim of UVF intimidation offered to show us around his temporary accommodation in the UFF's Lower Shankill Heartland. And why are they living Well, it's people who would feel safe being in their own houses during the day, but as soon as it gets dark, we know that there's gangs roaming around and they feel safer down here. And are they carrying out vigilante duties here at night? Some of them are. As I say, there's been a lot of random attacks carried out in the estate and most of the people here now feel that they have to do something to protect the estate and the people in the estate. So yeah, some of them are doing vigilante duties. The man asked for his face not to be shown because he feared UVF intimidation of himself and his family. But as is often the case when paramilitaries are involved, things aren't always as they seem. Spotlight later discovered that there was a distinct similarity between the voice of the man in the house and the masked UFF man who read out a statement in June threatening to collapse the peace process. From 12 o'clock tonight, 20th of June 2000, the Ulster Freedom Fighters reserves the right to shoot any person seen to be attacking Protestant homes. This will be in direct contradiction to our ceasefire, which we have steadfastly adhered to. Spotlight commissioned a special scientific analysis of the voice of the man in the mask and the voice of the man who claimed he was a victim of the feud. The detailed study, carried out by one of the UK's leading experts in the field, concluded that it was probable to highly probable that the two voices were those of the same man. That's what this is about, nothing else. It's just about the UVF trying to flex its muscle and take control of the shingle. Spotlight understands efforts are being made to broker a compromise involving senior military representatives from both sides outside the Shankill. But their political representatives recognise that real progress requires agreement on the ground. The UDP and the PUP cannot bring this to an end. All we can do is use influence. Just as community, other community leaders or other political parties can use their influence. 
Ultimately, it's up to the leadership in the UDA and in the UVF to decide if they want to have this resolved. This is Gary Smicker Smith, seen here with Johnny Adair. He told Spotlight there will be no peace without the agreement of the UFF C Company. Supporters of C Company, including Gary Smith, have been involved in a series of high profile demonstrations. At Drum Cree, they marched under a Shankill Road C Company banner, wearing UFF t shirts. Like Adair, Gary Smith was released early under the terms of the agreement. He was serving 16 years for conspiracy to murder. These pictures were taken days before Johnny Adair was sent back to jail. One of the men accompanying John White at the funeral of feud murder victim Bobby Mahood was William Winky Dodds. He was another willing to march under the C Company banner in a UFF t-shirt with Johnny Adair and his dog. A dog with a t-shirt. What sort of message does that send out to loyalism? Or about loyalism? You know, people think we're fools. They end the tolls with their knuckles trailing the ground. Here is Winky Dodds again, this time when scuffles broke out in the lower shankle prior to Adair's re-imprisonment. William Dodds is part of the UDA delegation to General John de Chastelin's decommissioning body. He has 11 terrorist convictions, as well as burglary, robbery and criminal damage. Another prominent loyalist seen marching under the C Company banner is William Samuel Courtney. He's known as Mo. His convictions cover assault, criminal damage, hijacking, robbery, raddest behaviour and assaulting police. Mo Courtney is linked to a restorative justice project which aims to steer young people away from crime. The project is partially funded by the government. On the day the feud erupted, C Company's members took to the stage and fired a volley of shots into the air. If we talk about C Company, because that's all I want to talk about, I, don't, I think that there are other strands of the UFF who don't want to begin down this road, but they're taking us into a cul-de-sac, and I think it's a very dangerous cul-de-sac. And, you know, I believe that loyalism, when it does come out, will be in very bad shape. John White was on the stage during the volley of shots. He denies the crowd took one of the gunmen to be Johnny Adair. No, that's uh, absolute nonsense. You know, that wasn't the case. The, uh, the, the men that came on were heavily disguised, and I don't think anyone uh, would have known who they were. The crowd made no suggestion that this was Johnny Adair on the stage? None whatsoever. And, you know, this can all be checked out. This is, you know, complete fabrication. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know where it's coming from, uh, uh, how, how my idea is. But if you would check with the, uh, the media who were there, uh, you know, they could confirm that that's nonsense. An eyewitness media report of the incident referred to the masked leader, whom the crowd clearly took to be Adair. The security force cameras on the top of Divis Tower have a clear view of the platform where the gunmen appeared. We understand the footage was examined to see if Adair was on the stage. We also understand the footage is being examined to see if this man is Gary Smicker Smith, who was freed under the terms of the agreement. Under the early release scheme, Gary Smith is out on license. The Secretary of State, Peter Mandelson, has the power to return him to prison at any time. So why is C Company at war with the UVF? As shown at the beginning of the feud, the greatest source of tension is C Company's emerging links with anti-agreement elements in the LVF. The problem was that people in the UVF thought that the contacts were just about drugs and not about anything else. But the, contact, you know, the whole context of these things were that there was more than one reason for making, making those contacts. And in my view, the contacts were made for people to try and realign loyalism. So there is no link between the UFF and West Belfast IEC Company and the LVF? There's no link whatsoever, and the UFF would never allow that because they're such a large or organisation. Um, they wouldn't see any benefits in, in joining up with such a small, small force. But recent events suggest otherwise. In Portadown this year, Johnny Adair presided over an LVF show of strength. Hours beforehand, Johnny Adair made a public statement when, at Drum Cree, he was joined by this man, Gary Fulton, who was wearing an LVF insignia on his shirt. Gary Fulton is a prominent LVF supporter in Portadown. Last month, Gary Fulton carried the coffin of Jackie Coulter, the UDA man killed in the feud. 
The allegations of drug dealing that surround C Company have led to questions about Johnny Adair and John White's income. Mr White lives in North Down and has half a dozen houses on the Shankill. Well, I've worked hard all my life. From when I was 11 years of age, I worked, you know, and uh, I always had savings. And while I was in prison, I worked very hard also. And I was able to uh, save the, the money that I made out of handicrafts, etc. And I invested uh, my money in the stock exchange and uh, invested in properties. And I was able to accumulate enough wealth so that when I was released from prison, I could put it to good use. He had been sent to prison for the brutal double murder of SDLP man Paddy Wilson and his friend Irene Andrews. In prison, White studied with Billy Hutchinson. One time friends, now turned enemies. I was concerned that the number of Protestants had been killed by the UBF, which I, I spoke out about. And I think this is when the personalities crept in between Billy and myself and uh, turned into almost hatred. I've heard what John White has had to say, and I know what he's at in the background with other people, uh, and I certainly wouldn't be meeting with him. I'm fed up listening to his crocodile, seeing his crocodile tears, and listening to his words of peace. And every time he mentions words of peace, someone else gets attacked. Two weeks into the feud, Billy Hutchinson went on holiday to France. Inevitably, he was accused of running away. Billy Hutchinson also served a life sentence for murdering two Catholics, Michael Loughran and Edward Morgan, when he was 19. It was while in prison he developed a passion for running. I wouldn't be too worried about drug dealers, would be right. You know, I'm here on a holiday, which was a planned holiday, uh, and you don't book one of these things, you know, like overnight. You just don't walk into a travel agent and book a holiday like this. It has to be booked months and months in advance, and this thing was booked you know, quite some time ago. I had to do and listen to people on the telephone, and I'd prefer to have been on the shingle rather than here. Uh, but circumstances dictate it differently. Uh, and I'm here, and I'll be back again shortly, uh, and uh, I'll be up and down the shingle for everybody to see. On the night he returned home from France, he refused to be searched when stopped by the police. The DMSU came into the car and trailed me out of it in the middle of the street. And then they said, we're doing a body search, and I said, you're not. Uh, and they put my arm up my back and threw me into the Landover and took me down the road. The feud saw the first explosion on the Shankill since the bomb when 10 people died. The UVF planted a device outside a prisoner's scheme where John White had an office. Bomb components were discovered in the debris. Well, it may look suspicious, but I certainly am not responsible uh, for uh, th those items, and neither are any of the people who work in that office. That office uh, is used by a large number of people. Um, it's used by ex-prisoner groups. It's used by uh, lower down public coming into it. And uh, certainly we're not responsible for those items that were found. And have the police spoken to you since the bomb components were discovered? Well, they haven't spoken to me, and I don't see any reason why they should. You know, I'm not a key holder. I work on the premises, but, you know, if the police want to speak to me, I'm available at any time. The bomb parts uncovered in the office had similarities with the blast bomb used by anti-agreement loyalists in the murder of RUC officer Frankie Riley, killed in Portadown two years ago. Another arms find was uncovered in a house in Snugville Street. John White showed spotlight details of his properties, including an insurance document for the same house where the weapons were uncovered. I had an interest in that house some years ago um, when I uh, attempted to purchase it, but the solicitor uh, of the other person who was buying it off didn't produce the deeds. He had lost the deeds. Um, so, you know, I couldn't uh, really illegally own the house until the, the deeds were reconstituted uh, by the other party, and, and that didn't happen. Spotlight has seen the secret report which sets out the reasons for Johnny Adair's re-imprisonment. It says he had been building up a significant drugs empire since his early release. Drugs have been sold from a derelict flat in the Lower Shankill for some time. The building is known locally as the Drugs House. Well, you tell me, is there a drugs house in the Lower Shankill? Are people operating it 24 hours a day? Are people being allowed to operate it? You tell me. And then you tell me, do you think a UFF commander, whoever he is in the Lower Shankill, uh, couldn't put a stop to it? There, there's no doubt that there is um, uh, drugs been sold in, in, in the Lower Shankill, and the police have uh, arrested individuals uh, on, on several occasions. 
but uh, you know, I'm convinced it's not a structural thing within the UDA. Can you put your hand on your heart and say that the UVF has never been involved in drugs? No, I can't, because UV, UV, UVF men have been involved in drugs and UVF men will be in the future. But what I can't say is that the leadership has a policy, and that policy is that no member of the organisation is allowed to deal in drugs, and they will frown on it very, very badly. And my understanding is that the penalty is death for people dealing in drugs. And, you know, the difference between the UVF and the UFF is that there seems to be people in the UFF leadership who seem to either support it, agree with it, or are dabbling in it. John White is equally critical of the leadership Billy Hutchinson has displayed during the feud. And I personally believe that he has been responsible for exacerbating the situation. Um, the, the two weeks that he was away, for example, when he ran to wherever he went to, uh, there was a lull, you know, and, and, and the violence between both sides. Am I the man who run away and then back extended? Well, I mean, sure. They can't have their cake and eat it. Either I'm a card or I'm making it harder for them. Shortly after his return from France, a bomb was thrown at Billy Hutchinson's family home. Uh, I've come to a stage now where I accept uh, that I am a target. And I've come to a stage to accept that, that, you know, that at some stage, you know, somebody will probably kill me. But there's nothing I can do about that. I have to get on with my job. If I was that worried, you know, I wouldn't have got involved in politics in the first place. Although John White says he's pro-agreement, he concedes many of those he represents in the Lower Shankle feel disillusioned. Well, there's no doubt that if you uh, ask anyone in this area what they feel about the agreement, they'll tell you that the Republicans and Nationalists are getting more out of it than Loyalists, and they would probably have a different viewpoint on whether they would vote for it if given uh, a, a, an option to do so. And, uh, you know, that has had a very negative effect, you know, on, on people's support for the Good Friday Agreement. Further evidence of an anti-agreement dimension to this feud is contained in many of the crude propaganda sheets. The prospect for peace must remain slim while the statements on the ground remain so divergent. For the UVF on the Shankle, there can be only one lasting solution to the feud. That is, Johnny Adair C Company must go. I, need, I want to see the UFF despond C Company. That's what I want to see. And I won't be happy until that happens. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, the problems that exist are the problems that have been created by C Company. Well, if they have adopted that position, there'll never be a solution. You know, C Company has the full support of the UDA, and that was witnessed in the statement that the EFF issued uh, a couple of weeks ago, saying this is not about C Company, and there's no way that C Company will be ostracised from the rest of the organisation. So the UVF and the PUP need to come to terms with that. Even if the feud can be resolved, Billy Hutchinson believes the killings will continue. Of course I want to see a resolution to it. Uh, I may not agree with the resolution, but what I can tell you, Kevin, is that you will be reporting the death of more UVF men, whether there's a resolution to this or not, because I'm convinced that there are still two people who are on the UVF side that will be killed, and they'll be killed by the LVF. And C Company will be involved in it up to their necks, and they will not admit responsibility. One of those he's referring to is a UVF commander. The other is Billy Hutchinson himself. John White is also living under a serious death threat. Like all the parties to the conflict, he rejects his enemy's accusations. I'd recognised for a very, very long time that the violence was futile and that the people were suffering so much that something needed to be done. There had to be change. And I, I took advantage of the situation. And I'm glad to say that I used my influence uh, in order to call, uh, help uh, bring about the ceasefire. But if it is wrong to judge such a man on the word of his enemies, some conclusions may be drawn from his friends. The man walking alongside John White is one of his main bodyguards. He is also the man who, in June, made this statement. From 12 o'clock tonight, 20th of June 2000, the Ulster Freedom Fighters reserves the right to shoot any person